Hello, this is David Patyandi. This is the Itasca webinar about material modeling support for PFC. Thank you for attending. I hope you enjoy this. We're going to spend one hour on this webinar. So let's begin by this. Uh, the bonded particle modeling methodology is described in this uh, journal paper I list below here. And I'm only going to briefly discuss that in this webinar because the focus of this webinar is the material modeling support package, which for those of you who've begun to use this is described in a comprehensive technical memo, which I list below. Um, and of course, you are probably also aware that this material modeling support package can be obtained uh, from the ITASCA website at the address listed below. Uh, Dave, can, I'm sorry, can we just make sure people are hearing all right? Sure. Could someone just put in the chat bar that the sound is okay, you're not getting feedback, please? The chat box is the, towards the bottom of your screen. Are you hearing us okay? It's good, sounds great, okay. All right, let's Thank continue. Thank you very much. So uh, there will be at least one, possibly two, depending on interest, future webinars in which I'll introduce the bonded particle modeling methodology. And in particular, uh, I will discuss how to calibrate the bonded particle model to match the behavior of a particular rock. Questions, because there are so many people attending this webinar, I cannot answer questions on the fly. But if you submit your questions during the webinar using the chat tool or if you send them, to Judy Zetterland at the address given, um, I will answer those questions. Um, I'll answer those questions. We'll post that to the Itasca website within two weeks, and this webinar will also be posted to the website. And you'll be sent a link to the materials when they're ready. All right, let's begin. So we're, we are going to talk a little bit to set the table here about bonded particle modeling. I'm just going to cover the essential features of the, uh, the concept. And then we're going to focus on the material modeling support package. Essentially, there's going to be a lecture. And throughout the lecture, there's going to be hands-on usage where we actually fire up the thing and I demonstrate to you how, it, how I suggest that it be used. All right, look at this. Here's the idea of a bonded particle model. Uh, this system here is a, a whole bunch of particles bonded together. Um, they've been colored. And you can see the boundary conditions. It's being squeezed from above and below. It's being pulled apart on the ends. This is an example from Martin Schopfer, who's a structural geologist. So if we do that, this is what we get. What you're seeing is bond breakages, denoted as black. You're seeing we're squeezing the material vertically. We're pulling it apart. Notice how it naturally begins to break apart into these separate pieces. That's the idea of a bonded particle model. That, this particular modeling was done as a means of trying to explain why we get these asymmetric fault systems, which are shown in the lower left corner. One of the uh, mechanisms purported to describe this is a shearing mechanism, where the top and bottom are moved in opposite directions, producing this type of pattern. This work here demonstrates that a uh, different mechanism could be involved, which is essentially just a tectonic uh, stretching along with some overburden stress. So that's a scientific application of a, a particular bonded particle model. I plug for Martin Schopfer, look him up on the internet. He's done a substantial amount of really good work um, building bonded particle models and applying them to structural geology. So the basic idea of a bonded particle model, we have grains, we have bonds, Damage consists of bond breakages. The idea here is that you construct a base material. In this case, these are there's about 100 by 100 disks that have been bonded together in this 2D model. There's a means to add joints using the smooth joint contact model. Um, and then what we do here is we begin to apply loading to this. Here it's an unconfined compression test. And then we're getting this damage. In this case, we're getting breakage of the intact rock. You can see these green things, uh, the, sorry, these red lines bridging. And then we're localizing and breaking the uh, connections along the joint. And these are an uh, uh, interesting part about this is this is an emergent phenomenon. You set some very basic microstructural properties, 
and then you apply load to this, and then you see this emergent behavior as damage forms. So the bonded particle modeling methodology is implemented in the PFC programs, PFC 2D and 3D, and what those are are just uh, general purpose distinct element modeling codes, and they include a computational engine and a graphical user interface. And the basic idea of that is they're simply simulating the movement and interaction of a large number of finite sized particles using something we call the distinct element method, which is nothing more than an explicit dynamic solution to Newton's laws of motion. In this type of model, the particles are rigid bodies, they have mass, they move independently of one another, and they can both translate and rotate. They interact at these contacts that form between the particles. At those contacts, there can be a force and there can be a moment. The whole con idea of contact mechanics is embodied in a particle interaction law that employs what we call a soft contact approach. And that means that all the deformation occurs at the contact. Um, and that particle interaction law, which we call a contact model, updates those forces and moments. Here we're seeing an assembly subjected to gravity. It's now in a settled state. These are the forces that are acting at the contact. Thickness is proportional to force magnitude. You can see that uh, the force gets higher as you go closer to the bottom because of the weight above. What is this soft contact approach? Here's the basic idea. Um, pretend that I, we have, we pretend we have two baseballs and they're, they're uh, pushed between steel plates. And let's say I go and stand on that steel plate. I have a weight. I'm going to cause a deformation delta on that top plate. Notice that if we have baseballs in there, they're going to contract and they're going to expand. And notice that at what's happening at the contacts, they're going to deform locally at the contacts. The, the soft contact approach means that we model this system as rigid grains that cannot change their shape. However, they can overlap. So let me go back between the two. That's the real system. That's a distinct element model. Okay, that's what we mean by a soft contact approach. All the deformation occurs at the contacts. Okay, um, and then what we do is we have stiffnesses at those contacts. And the last thing is that the stiffnesses can be related to an effective modulus of an equivalent continuum. So instead of this system, we can think, oh, this spring represents this hunk of uh, elastic material. And then we can specify an elastic modulus. And knowing the uh, geometry of the system, we can relate the elastic modulus to those spring stiffnesses. That's the how we're going to typically input micro properties to our systems. All right, enough said. PFC model. There's three entities in there. There's the particles are either balls, they can be balls, they can be clumps. They obey the law of motion, they interact with one another. A clump is made up of a bunch of pebbles that are going to act as a single rigid body. And then we have walls. Walls are going to be used to apply velocity boundary conditions. They are essentially surfaces that you can make move that will interact with the system. And so here's an example. This is a box. There's three particles in there. The top wall is moved down. Notice the wall can overlap other walls because they don't interact with each other. And here's the forces. And so we've got that squeezed in there. Okay. There you go. That's the whole entire distinct element method in a nutshell. The one thing I want to point out, in a 2D, PFC 2D model, what we're really modeling are unit thickness disks. They're in the XY plane, and here's the Z direction. So the models look like this on the left here, but what they really are modeling the physics of are unit thickness disks. All right. That PFC model provides a synthetic material. I think of it as a synthetic material, which consists of these rigid grains that are interacting at the contacts. And the key element here is this encompasses a vast microstructural space, okay? There's an amazing amount of microstructures that one can construct with this type of model. And at this point, uh, in terms of people applying this model and developing it, only a very small portion of this space has been explored, okay? Um, the PFC model includes granular or bonded materials. And the most up-to-date incarnation of the PFC model is provided in the form of either a linear, a contact bonded, a parallel bonded, or a flat jointed material. These models are used for both practical applications where you make boundary value models or scientific, also scientific inquiry where you're actually trying to further explore this microstructural space. Can we make a microstructure that behaves like a sandstone? Can we make a microstructure that behaves like a particular kind of sandstone? How about a limestone? Um, those are the kind of things that one does with this type of a model. So again, the basic idea 
you have these grains, they're joined by, you can think of those contacts as cement. It's deformable, it's breakable. The grains can either be balls or clumps, and the cement can either be a contact bond, parallel bonded contact, or a flat jointed contact. When that thing breaks, it behaves like a linear contact. A linear contact is simply springs, a normal spring, a shear spring, and a concept of a friction coefficient so they can slide. So really it's, it's the type of contact model at those grain-grain contacts that defines what I call a PFC material, okay? So we then might have, for example, a contact bonded material. Um, such a material then is defined by a set of material properties. These material properties are going to control the material genesis procedure. We have to go through a procedure of actually constructing and packing the system to make our models. And then what we do is we install that contact model at model at selected contacts in that packed assembly. Okay. Now, if we were actually talking about the bonded particle model, we'd spend another uh, 45 minutes examining uh, each of these contact models so that we understand what the fundamental properties of those things are because we're going to end up setting properties to describe our materials. There's no time for that. Um, there's going to be a few future webinars where we talk about that. Let's move on now to this material modeling support package. Uh, again, I'm going to have a lecture where I walk you through capabilities of the package and as we're going, we're going to uh, actually use the package along the way. Let's begin. So again, this is what I've said before, that PFC model gives us this synthetic material. Um, PFC model includes both granular or bonded materials, and those bonded materials are called bonded particle models, or BPMs. Support for material modeling that we provide in PFC5 consists of a consistent set of fish functions. Fish is an embedded language in PFC, very much like Python. Um, we call this the PFC5 fish tank, or fist package. So I'm going to give you an overview of the fist package. We have this idea of some material vessels and a material genesis procedure that builds the material in those vessels. We first have to go through a packing phase where we pack the grains, then we go through a finalization phase where we actually assign the final properties. Think of packing a bunch of marbles in some kind of a container first and then adding cement between those marbles. That would be the packing phase and the finalization phase. For the, we then need to describe our materials. As you're going to see, there's a set of common properties for all the different materials, and then there's a specific set of properties, additional properties, for each of the material types. There's a capability to do microstructural monitoring to actually look in detail at the, what these, uh, what's going on at these contacts. It'll look like a little bit of cement, for example, between them, if that's the type of uh, material you have. And then we support standard laboratory uh, rock mechanics testing. So we're going to talk about how do we measure stress and strain and porosity in those tests in this material. And then we're going to uh, pr we provide the ability to do a compression test, which is essentially a triaxial test, a uh, diametral compression, which rock mechanics folks describe as a Brazilian test, and also direct tension. We do these types of laboratory tests typically to calibrate the material. We want to say, I want to match the Young's modulus, the Poisson ratio, and the peak strength of a granite. Um, I also want to match the tensile strength. So you need to then choose a set of, create a microstructure, assign it properties, and then do these tests to determine have I actually succeeded in doing that. That, that whole process I'm going to talk about in a future webinar. Um, and then in this package we also provide some examples. We give an example of each of the different types of materials. All right. Material vessel. So all of the materials are produced in a material vessel. And the uh, procedure we use is such that you get a homogeneous, isotropic, and well-connected grain assembly. And in order to do that, there has to be some sort of material pressure. These things have to be squeezed together and packed. There has to be some material pressure. The higher the material pressure is, the more the overlap is between the grains. Okay? Um, at the contacts with the walls, we make the walls be frictionless. And so then all we have is a normal stiffness for the linear contact model. But instead of specifying typically the, the stiffness, we specify the effective modulus. Remember my little picture of me standing on the uh, baseballs? Uh, this effective modulus that you're going to specify for the vessel should be greater than or equal to the, mo the actual modulus of the assembly. If you don't have it, if it's too soft, these particles are going to protrude greatly from the material vessel. 
Here's the different material vessels that we provide in 2D. It's a rectangular uh, shape. Again, this is all, everything's parameterized here. Um, in 3D, we have a polyaxial cell uh, and also a cylindrical cell. Notice the cylindrical cell, there's going to be some overlap between these things. Remember, the walls do not interact with each other. This is going to uh, allow us to move these walls such that we don't end up having particles escaping. So, in this uh, package, what you end up having are these different data files that describe the different parameters. For all the different sets of parameters, there's a table. It's going to tell you the fish name. It's going to tell you, oh, this is an integer, default values, et cetera, okay? Um, this is all taken directly from the uh, material modeling support memo. <clears throat> so here's the idea, a material vessel. Here we're saying it's a physical vessel. It has a shape of a cylinder. We're giving a height and a width to define it um, and, other, and other things. This is what this looks like. Here's the data file. MV, material vessel, set parameters. Here we go. We're specifying values for these parameters. Oh, values. We need to talk about units, okay? The package is going to assume that you're working in SI units. The only reason it's doing that is it's going to provide plots um, in, like, it's going to say, here's a plot of deviatoric stress versus axial strain. Those plots are going to have, unit, uh, are going to have units on them, which are SI units. The PFC code doesn't care what units as long as they're consistent, but this package, in order to have the legends on the plots be useful, uh, they're assuming you're doing SI units. So this system here is a height of 240 millimeters and a width of a, a diameter of 170, okay? Um, there's a function you can call, material vessel list props here, and then this is going to dump out to you all the different values that it's currently using based on what you had put as input. There is also a microstructural box that you can define, and we'll talk about this uh, in a little bit, where this is going to let you look in detail at the microstructure. Um, that is defined in terms with this function here, MF box defined center, and then it's a rectangular parallel pipette. Now, this packing phase of material genesis, what do we do? We generate a cloud of grains from a size distribution that you specify. We allow them to rearrange into a packed state under conditions of zero friction. Then we somehow have to squeeze that thing or unsqueeze it so we get a material pressure. There's two ways of obtaining that material pressure. You can either do boundary contraction where we're going to move the walls under control of a servo mechanism so that we obtain the desired material pressure or we're going to do something called grain scaling. We don't move the walls at all. What we do is we iteratively change the size of the grains. You want to get a higher pressure, you, make, you iteratively make the grains larger. During this process of boundary contraction, we have a means of controlling the final porosity of the system. Basically, what we do is when we're squeezing it and doing the boundary contraction, you can specify what is the friction coefficient that should be used during that process. If you set that friction coefficient to zero, it's going to pack to the densest state. If you set that friction coefficient progressively higher all the way up into the real material friction, it's going to, it's going to lock up sooner and it's going to have a higher porosity. It'll be a looser state. This, is wor this works relatively well. People have been able to construct granular systems using this where they can go from the dense to the loose state and everywhere in between, and then they look at the different uh, response that you would expect for a soil, for example. Um, all right. Here again, then, are these packing parameters. Of course, I don't have time here. Um, I'm not going to talk about every single one. Again, these are all described in that memo. Again, these are in a different data file called material property parameters. I just want to make a mention. There's a concept of a, of a packing seed. This is a seed of a random number generator. When we generate the cloud of grains, we use a random jump number generator to, to position them. If we change that seed of that random number generator, we get a differently arranged cloud of grains. So you're going to have some variability in that packing microstructure by just changing the seed. Um, again, then, here's the packing parameters. In this case, we're going to pack this system to 150 kPa, um, and we're going to use boundary contraction. All right? Uh, also, we're only specifying in these data files, the ones that I give you in the example, I'm only specifying kind of the, the, the most important parameters. The other parameters 
are going to all have default values. Okay, that's partly why we give you this MP list microprops because it'll then list out all the parameters and what the values that the system is actually using for them. All right, let's go and actually use the fish tank package now. We're going to basic. We're going to go and create this material in this cylindrical vessel. And we're going to do it, do it two different ways. We're going to set that friction coefficient during the boundary contraction to zero to get a dense system. And we're going to set it to 0.4 um, so that we end up getting a less dense system with the higher porosity. So let's go out to, I've got a directory called models. In that directory, what do I have? I have the FIST package 25. This is version 25 of the FIST tank package. This is what you download. Uh, this is exactly what you download um, from the website. I've also got a little PowerPoint file here. Um, this is where I'm going to go and make some plots to look at model response. We'll do that in a moment. So what do we have in the FIST package? We, we have a README file. It's going to talk about what are the capabilities. What are the, there's an example project tells you about that. There's a public modifications file. Oh, this is FIST package version 25. This is the date it was released. These are some of the changes or enhancements, etc. cetera. Um, Here's the layout. This is the direct the contents of all the directories you have. Key thing is there's a documentation directory, and then there's all these different example projects. In the documentation directory are the different technical memos. In particular, this is that material modeling support memo. What is it? 67 pages, and it talks all about in detail uh, uh, the, the, the package. There's also then has part of that memo different examples. And so here's an example of a contact bonded material, page 15. Here we go. Here's a contact bonded material. Here's the material, pro material properties. Here's what it looks like. We're going to talk about that. And then we give some examples. Here's some of the things you produce with that. We'll walk through all that in a moment. Let me shut off my PDF viewer. I want to make sure I don't shut off the webinar in the process, okay? Now, here's the example projects. What we have in here is fifth source. This is the, that's the, the, that's the fish functions that are, that are uh, creating this. You shouldn't have to do anything with that. And then each directory has a project that creates a particular kind of material, okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go and we're going to copy this example project file. We're going to go back up to our models directory. We're going to paste it here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to rename it. Oh, we're going to say example projects. Let's say we're going to work with the linear model. I'll call it linear play. We're going to play with the linear model. So I go in here. Now I don't have the documentation. This whole thing is quite small. I'm going to get rid of all the other examples just to keep things clean. So flat jointed hill. We're just going to leave that linear project example going to get rid of these things. These are macro scripts that will actually go and fire up and build all the materials and test all the materials. Not going to talk about that. I'm trying to do the simplest possible thing here. All right. So now we're going to go in here and we're also going to rename this. We're going to call it linear one. Actually, no, let's do this. Linear and we're going to change that peak frick CA value. Let's have one of them be zero. Then we're going to copy this again, paste, and this time we're going to have a case where we're going to set that value to 0 0.4. So let's go in where the one was zero. Here we go. Here's the uh, PFC 3D project. We fire it up. What do we got for time here? Okay. Um, here's this driver. We're going to run it. Here's the material vessel. You can see that this is the boundary contraction. Can you see the vessel walls? squeezing inward. We're going to look at, there's some plots here. This is a plot of the porosity in the system. Notice the porosity is getting lower as the thing gets squeezed more. We're trying to squeeze it to 150 kPa pressure. So let's look at what we got there. Here is the mean stress in that system. I got to rescale the history. So my y-axis, I want the minimum value. It's, we're trying to get to 150 kPa, so let's make it be 500 kPa. Whoops, 500 E3. There we go. And there we are looking at what the uh, pressure is. Here it is, 150 kPa is right there. Pressure is being measured in two ways. It's being measured based on the forces on the walls. We divide that by the wall area. 
That's a measure of pressure. It's also being measured with a magic thing that you can't do in a real laboratory experiment, which is make something called a measurement sphere. Basically, we can go inside the material. It's finished. Let me get it back up again here. You can go inside the material with this measurement sphere, and you can do things like you can basically look at all the contact forces. You can integrate that over the volume and come up with an equivalent stress tensor. Okay. So this is an internal measurement and an external measurement. For most cases, these things are going to be the same. So here we are. We're, we've got to about 150 MPa. Notice the porosity has gone down to 0.38, and we're pretty much at a, at a stable porosity here. Okay. Um, let's keep this PFC going, and let's go back out. Oh, let's just first let's make sure here. This particular model. Here's my material property parameters. There we go. The friction during confinement application was zero. So that's our case where it should be the most dense. Now let's go go back out here. Let's go up to my other example, which the friction coefficient was 0.4. So I'm firing up another PFC. You can have as many as you want up. And now this time I'm going to start it, but then I'm going to stop it in a minute. I'm going to hit control escape. No, wait, is it shift escape? There we go. I forced it to stop while it was cycling, it's telling me stuff. Oh, an error occurred because you forced it to stop. That's fine. I wanted to stop it because what I want to do is go into its material properties, and I want to change this friction during confinement to be 0 0.4. Now I'm going to rerun it. Here we go. Now I'm looking at the material. There's the boundary contraction squeezing it. Let's pull up the porosity plot. Let's pull up the mean stress plot. Where's mean stress? There it is. Again, I'm going to change this history. Y axis, minimum value, minus 500 kPa. Boom, there we go. Remember, this, this system has a higher friction coefficient while it's being compacted. We would expect that it's going to stabilize at a more porous thing. Think of it, this thing, is, it's got high friction. We got a pressure on it. It's at a certain porosity. What if we went now and suddenly made it frictionless? The thing would squeeze down more and get to a lower porosity. Turn that back on. All right. So we've got the first model. Let's look at its porosity. This one went down to 0.38. We've got the other model. It only went down to 0.42. Now, here's the thing that people often want to do. We want to compare these things, okay? I'm going to actually just do that. And what we're going to do is we're going to make some plots that are the same. We're going to pull those into PowerPoint, and then we're going to look at them with PowerPoint, all right? So if we want to compare these things, let's go between the two. We're, let's, let's make the porosity go from 0.35 up to higher. So I'm going to change the history. I'm going to do y-axis and minimum value of 0.35 in this model. There we go. I'm going to go to the other PFC model. I'm going to do the same thing. Y-axis, minimum value, 0.35. All right. Now I can look at them on the screen. I can swap between the two. And now they have the same, they have the same uh, axes. All right. So now what I want to do is Make a PowerPoint plot of this. Here's, the, here's what I suggest to do. We're going to go to layout, and we're going to say wide. That way the window is going to be the same size in both models. Then I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to say export to a bitmap. And here's an important thing. I'm going to, I'm going to make this a custom bitmap. I'm going to make the width and height be 4,000 and 2,400 pixels. This is a really good size. It's not too big, but you can suck this into Word documents and PowerPoint things, and you should have sufficient resolution that it looks good, okay? These are the kind of things you never know unless you run the code a lot. All right, I'm going up to my models directory. There we go at the top level, and I'm going to say, I'll just call this one F1. It just made a PNG file. I'm going to go to my other PFC. I'm going to do layout wide so I get the same orientation. I'm going to say bitmap. I'm going to go up to models. I'm going to say f2.png. 
Let's make sure that it actually did that. There's the two PNG files. I can open them with a the viewer. There they are. Let's go in my power. Now I'm going to open up my runs.powerpoint. So I already made it. It's a blank one. It's got two things. One of them says peak friction angle is zero. One says peak friction angle of 0.4. Zero. Insert picture. Let's go to where that is. Just a moment. In models, F1. Boom. Go to the next slide. Insert picture. Models, F2. Now I should be able to go between them. And there you go. So with a zero friction coefficient, it went it packed to a porosity of 0.38. With a higher one, it packed to a higher porosity. You can compare the two. There you go. This is how we this is a really useful way to work with PFC and look at plots. All right, enough of that for now. Let's shut that PowerPoint down. Save. Let's go back to the talk. You got it? All right. Let's continue on. That was the packing phase. Now we're going to talk about the finalization phase, okay? This means we've got a packed assembly now. Now we're going to actually assign the final material properties to that. Um, and perhaps we also are going to have to specify what are the properties that we're going to have when new contacts form. Right now there's a certain number of contacts. When we continue to load this thing, there's going to be some new contacts forming and these contacts breaking. So all of those things are specified here in the material parameters for particular materials. All right. Here's an important per parameter when we do bonded materials. We have this parameter which we call an installation gap. And that's going to control the grain connectivity. It's a very important parameter. Here's a pack, the same packed assembly. This is a typical particle inside of it. If we set the installation gap to zero, it means we're only going to create contacts at places where uh, the particles are actually overlapping. If we set that installation gap to delta, now we're going to create contacts everywhere that that delta circle intersects. So now there's going to be contacts at, in gaps, okay? Increasing that installation gap is going to increase the overall connectivity of the material. And when we do that, that's going to increase the overall material modulus and the overall material strength. All right. The other thing that's happening during the finalization phase for bonded materials is we're establishing reference surfaces that do not overlap. We're going to do this so that this initial material we've created is going to have no forces or moments. It's, it's basically like we've created this perfect initial configuration. Um, what that essentially means is, for example, if we have a, in a case where the guys are not touching, depending on what type of material it is, we're going to basically, these are the reference surfaces. We're going to, if it's a parallel bond, we're going to say that it's like the gap is filled with cement. Uh, if it's a flat joint, we're going to have that uh, gap, uh, gap in there. If they're overlapping, we're going to set it so that the surfaces are like this. Here's an example. Um, this is a parallel bonded material. These are the reference surfaces. So when we have a system that's not touching and we say put in a, put in a parallel bond there, what's going to happen is effectively this red thing and this green thing, this red thing is connected to the guy up there, this green thing is connected to the guy down there. These guys are just perfectly overlapping and bonded to begin with. If that bond breaks, those are the reference surfaces. Uh, if the thing is overlapping, we're going to establish the reference surfaces like this. So that those are the surfaces where all the interaction is occurring. This type of thing is similar to these are glass beads cemented with epoxy. This case here where they're not touching but they're still cement, uh, that would be the case here. Uh, if you had beads that were not quite touching but they were filled with cement to fill that gap. Enough said. That's all I can talk about for, for a moment. The last thing. When we have this thing packed, there's going to be some overlaps between the vessel walls and the material. We can do the same game with these reference surfaces so that we effectively can cut off those bumps, set the reference surfaces to zero so that now there is no force to begin with. Subsequent motion will start to make force develop there. So when this material genesis procedure is completed, we have, we're going to create two save files. We're going to save the material when it's the, the walls are all still in place, and then we're going to use that to do uh, compression tests or things like that. Also, if it's a bonded material, we're going to remove it from the vessel, we're going to remove those walls, and we're going to save the state. That's now, now we've created a hunk of synthetic material. We can now do a boundary value simulation. Okay. Um, let's go and create a contact bonded material and look at this thing. So I'm going to go back out. I'm going to go back up. 
to my models directory, and I want to make another example project. So I go into my fifth package, I copy the example projects in its entirety, I put it in here. I'm going to rename this one Contact Bond Play. So C Bond Play. I'm going to go in here. I'm going to remove everything except for the contact bonded example. If you're watching this webinar, it would be very useful for you to do exactly the same thing I'm doing step by step. All right. I'm going to go in here now. I'm going to run this. Now this is going to build a contact bonded material. So here we go. Here's my material vessel. Let's look at what's going on. Here's the porosity. This one is doing, this one is doing, uh, let's get that back, it's finished. This one is not doing boundary contraction. This one is doing grain scaling. So here's the material vessel. Here's the two save files. This is when it's still in the vessel. Notice the walls are there. This is when it's not in the vessel anymore. This is the mean stress. And notice how the mean stress has, it started out very high and now the particles have essentially been made smaller, made smaller, made smaller until I achieve the mean stress, which in this case was 30 MPa. If I look in this particular contact bonded example, there's the mean stress, 30 MPa. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint thing. It's this one, I believe. Good enough, okay. Now, we can also look at, uh, we're going to be able to compute the microstructural properties, some of the properties, things like the grain size, the packing information, the grain size distribution, things like that. One of the things for bonded materials is this thing called a bond coordination number. This is the average number of bonds per grain. So it's the average number of, of, of pieces of cement that tie the thing together. Okay? The higher the bond coordination number, the higher the material modulus and strength again. You got more cement in there. Okay? Um, you can increase that bond coordination number either by, oh, increase the material pressure so the thing is more tightly packed and you'll get more contacts and they'll have a higher bond coordination number. Or you can just say, oh, I'll pack it loosely, but I'm going to increase that installation gap. So I'm going to end up putting bonds at places that the guys are not actually touching. Again, either way, you're going to increase that bond coordination number. You're going to, uh, enough said. We can talk about all of this in the next webinar when we talk about calibration and things. Um, Again, there's a uh, function MP list microstruct props, which is going to now tell you these things, these microstructure properties. So, number of grains, grain size distribution, we'll talk about that. There's a plot that's going to show it. Average grain diameter, median grain diameter, vessel resolution. This is an important one. What's the average number of grains across the smallest dimension of the vessel? For that system, there's about 10, 10 grains across the diameter. We need to reach a certain so number of grains across the diameter until we start to get similar behavior. Just like in ISRM when they have, when you do a compression test on the material to get a valid compression number, what does it have to be there, Charles? 20? They typically suggest 20 grains. 10. Is 10 the number? Okay. Um, all right. Enough said. If it's a bonded material, there's also going to be this bond coordination number. All right. Then there's these common material parameters. For example, there's a material name. Uh, that material name is going to be, is used for the, all these different plots, the material name here was SS contact bonded. Oh, so it's going to say that in all these plots. Oh, this is the SS contact material, um, et cetera. Going back to here, this one. Um, again, there's all sorts of different parameters that are coming. What's the damping factor? The damping we're going to use in the material. We want that to be 0.7 if we're doing a quasi-static type. We want the system to behave in a quasi-static fashion. Here we're going to specify information about the size distribution. Uh, again, here's the example of this. Now let's look at this. Oh, I've already done. Let's do this next one. The size distribution, okay? Here's a size distribution curve, this black line. This is percent passing a sieve. It goes from 0% to 100%. This is grain size. Essentially, the grains lie from this size to that size. And here, then, is the volume fraction by mass in all these different chunks uh, that we have. If you want to then, so you have a size distribution curve. What you're going to end up doing is you're going to break that curve up into a number of linear segments. For each segment, 
you're going to specify it. What's the lower diameter and what's the, what's the diameter here? What's the diameter there? And then you're going to say, what's the volume fraction of that chunk? So that's what this is doing here. Volume fraction is 0.1. It goes from 100 to 90%. Volume fraction is 0.2. It goes from 90 to 70%. And then you have the corresponding diameters. Okay. Let's actually look at this. So we're going to go back. Oh, I got too many PFCs open here. Let's close that previous one. Let's close that other previous one. Go back to this contact bonded one. This contact bonded material, there it is. One of these plots is the size distribution. This is the size distribution. What I told it when I made this material is I said go from a diameter of four to six millimeters, uniform size distribution. So if we look at that, this grain size is going from four millimeters to six millimeters. Okay. Now let's go and change that size distribution. And let's instead, let's go from, let's make two different size distributions. So number of size divisions, two. Let's for the first size distribution, let's go from one to two millimeters. And that's going to be 50% of the material is going to be of the size from one to two millimeters. And I'm going to copy and paste. And now for the second chunk of the size distribution, again, 50%. I'm going to go, where's my notes here? One to two, I'm going to go from four to six millimeters. Four, two, six, point five. Get rid of that. Let's run this now. In addition, I'm just playing with this right now. I don't need to go through the whole packing process. There's a parameter in this is material property. Make the material at the top level driver file. I'm going to set that to one. Watch what happens. When I run this now, it says, oh, error. No, actually, it says fish is stopping as planned. Microstructural properties have been listed above. This has just created the grain cloud, but it hasn't done any cycles. Now that I have the grain cloud, I can go and look at its size distribution. Okay, because I might, you might want to play around. You're going to be playing around with the size distribution until you get what you want. And you don't want to have to go through the whole material genesis process. You just want to generate the size distribution. So here it is. Remember, half of the grains, there it is, 50% are from four to six millimeters. The other 50% are from one to two millimeters, just like we had specified. Okay, enough said. Let's go back to this. All right, we're running out of time. Let's go, there we go. Let's go to the next slide. Here's an important thing. You often want to shift the size distribution. So we'll go back to this thing, and here's all you're going to do. So we have this size distribution and we're going to we're going to do a multiplying factor so that all all of the things are now double all of the diameters of the all the particles are going to be doubled so now this it, we're we're going to run that when we do that stop they're much bigger now there's not as many of them if we look at the size distribution now instead of going from 1 to 2 millimeters the low end that should go from 2 to 4 which we have and then way out here, instead of going from 4 to 6, it should go from 8 to 12. So this way you can get in your size distribution and then you can, you can tune it. You can move, shift it up or down. In all cases of DEM modeling, we always end up having to throw away the low end of the size distribution because we have too many particles. The particles in the small part of the size distribution dominate the number of particles. So this is a useful way then that you can shift the size distribution uh, by just changing those parameters. All right. Now, quickly mention microstructural plots. These are provided to actually look, actually look at the material microstructure and look at how it's evolving. We can generate plots that look like this. Remember that microstructural box? We're going to be able to look at like the grains in the box. This is showing the contact bonds that are of those grains. This is showing the parallel bonds. Notice they look like hunks of cement based on this. Okay. Let's just do that for a minute. So let's go back. The PFC. All right, I'm going to go back to what I had before. I just had one size distribution from four to six. Volume fraction is one. Size number of size distributions is one. I get rid of the second size distribution and the demultiplier. 
This should have been that original material. Let's build it. They're stopping as planned because I was still telling it to stop. Go back to this. Run it now. There we go. Packing this. This is when, when you're doing bigger models, it takes longer, right? That's when you go and get some coffee. Um, in bigger models, you might have to go home and go to sleep and come back in the morning. Um, whoops, she's finished. Let's go back here. Look at this. Da -da -da. Uh, there's the system. Now, let's look at the system when it's got the walls in it. We're going to say microstructural monitoring on, so I'm calling that function. It's computing all the things it needs to build up that plot, and now I'm going to look at that. So I'm going to say turn off the balls, and I'm going to say this guy, there's the microstructural box. Now I want to look at the balls that are in the microstructural box. There they are. Remember, you can change that microstructural box. Turn off the walls, and then, for example, I want to look at the contact bonds that are in there. So I turn off the balls in there. There's the contact bonds that are in there. All right. Moving along, and then again, for every single material, there's a well-defined set of material properties. We don't have time to go through this at this lecture. We're going to move on. There's linear properties. There's contact bonded material properties. There's parallel bonded material properties. There's slide jointed material properties. These are all controlling the microstructure, and there's a vast type amount of microstructures that you can create using these parameters. Um, all right. There's the ability to monitor cracks. A bond breakage, we're going to call it a crack, okay? And this is going to allow us to visualize them, all right? In a 3D model, a crack is a uh, disk. So there, it's a tension test. We pulled it apart. Look at all those cracks. Here's in a 2D model, it's a segment of unit thickness depth. There they are in that one. Now, we're going we're gonna to perform standard rock mechanics tests. So just like in the lab, we have to monitor things. So we're going to use these three measurement spheres. They're going to be positioned inside the specimen. And, for each, and then we're going to use this to compute stresses and strains. So there's your stresses and strains. The convention here is uh, positive is tension. Uh, positive stress, positive strain, positive strain is extension. And we're going to measure them in two different ways. We're going to use those measurement spheres. We're also going to use the wall values, OK? And all those things are then provided by these different uh, fish variables as this thing is being monitored. Here's the type of test that we're, we support. There's a triaxial test, compression test. It can either be a confined test with some pressure that's kept constant. It can be an unconfined test. It can also be a uniaxial strain test where the sides don't move. Here's your Brazilian test, and then here's your direct tension test. All right. When we do these tests, we either perform them in a polyaxial cell for the compression test or a triaxial cell, and we control the uh, sidewalls by means of a servo mechanism so we can maintain a constant pressure. Um, when we do these tests, we first have to seat the specimen to get the initial pressure we want. Then we're going to do a loading phase, okay? An important thing, these are the compression test parameters. An important point to note is the most important parameter is the axial strain rate, okay? This is, you're going to tell it how fast to load the specimen. PFC is a truly dynamic model. If you load it really fast, it will be really strong, just like a real material. Most of the time, you're trying to reproduce quasi-static tests. Thus, you need to choose a small enough axial strain rate so that you get the same response, even if you make it slower. Okay? This is the most often made mistake that people do when they're doing discrete element modeling. I've even seen PhD theses where everything is done, and the results are meaningless because everything was run at a strain rate that was too high and thus the results are not quasi-static. Um, very important test. Here we go. Let's run do a compression test. Let's turn off our PFC. Discard that project. OK, let's see if I can do this here. We're going to go back out. Again, we're going to go into the fish package itself. We're going to copy out the examples. We're going to put them here. We're going to rename this C-Bond UCS. That's the thing we're going to play with. Okay, again, let's get rid of everything except for the contact bonded example, just to keep everything clean. Delete. Yes. Here we go. Contact bonded material. Let's build it. This is what we've already done before. 
here we go. This one only has about 10 grain resolution, 10 by 10, runs pretty fast. Notice we're not doing a 2 to 1 aspect ratio specimen. The walls are frictionless. What we find when we do these things is if we do a 1 to 1 or 2 to 1, we get this pretty much the same answers. A 1 to 1 is smaller, has less particles. Um, those are all the kind of things we'll talk about in the next lecture. Um, here we go. I've just built that specimen. Now I'm going to say open a new, open a project. I'm going to go down to the compression test directory. Here we go. I'm going to run it, compression test. So here's my cell. I'm going to do an unconfined compression test. So what it first did is it moved the side walls away from the specimen, and it's using the top and bottom walls to do the test. The test is running right now. Um, let's look at what's going on inside that material. We can do that. Let's look at the contact forces. Those are the contact forces. Black is compression, red is tension um, being uh, through the system. Let's look at the contact forces. Instead of coloring them by that, let's color them by, color them by magnitude. Red is heavy magnets, it's large values. The blue is smaller values. It's the same plot, but they're colored differently. Compression tension, actual values, magnitude. Um, it's the force chains in the material that control all of the material response. That's the most important thing. That's what controls everything about how uh, the material will respond. While the test is running, let's look at, oh, here we go, stress strain. This is deviatoric stress. Notice in Pascal's, because I assume you got SI units, so I can put that word in there, Pascal's. Deviatoric stress versus axial strain. So it's loading up right now. We might also want it to, just like in a real test, this is the radial strain versus axial strain. So we're squeezing it and it's bulking out, okay? We also typically monitor the volumetric strain in here. So the material is still actually compressing. It's getting smaller. Um, when it begins to fail, you're going to start to see an expansion of the, ra of, the, of the radial strain because of the cracks. Let's also look at the cracks versus, oh, it's starting to crack. Let's go back to the plot. We can see that. Crack monitoring package. Let's turn off those. See that? It's starting to crack. All right. Doesn't really manifest itself in the axial stress strain plot, but in the radial stress strain plot, we it's notice it's beginning to be a little bit nonlinear. As the cracking proceeds, this radial strain is going to be the most sensitive to um, noting that. There's more cracking. What does it look like? Oh, here we go. There's more cracks forming. If I look down on them, notice they're mostly subparallel to the axial compression direction. This would be sigma one. This is what happens in real rock. You squeeze it and you get these axial line cracks. That's why we're getting the radial bulking because the cracks are, tend to be oriented like this. This is a natural manifestation of any sort of heterogeneous bonded material. Again, we'll talk about that in a subsequent lecture when we actually talk about the physics of this thing. Um, here we're talking about the mechanics of running this package. Here we go. Radial strain is suddenly getting nonlinear. Here's volumetric strain. It's starting to begin. We're going to start to get a strain reversal. There's, we're almost at the peak. This is axial stress versus axial strain. Um, now we're at the peak. All this cracking is going on. Let's see if I can catch it before it stops. There we go. Continuing to crack. Now it, it stopped. You're probably saying, that's really annoying. Why does it keep shutting itself down? If you don't want it to shut down in the main driver, you can comment out this exit here. We do this because then we can run those, that top level driver which will basically go and call PFC, do a test. When a test is done, it will call another PFC, do another test. So every time a test is done, we want to shut down the system. Um, all right. That's, I think I got the main things we wanted to describe there. Let's go back to the talk. We have six minutes left. We can also do this Brazilian test. Basically, we're going to squeeze the thing between two walls. Let's go out and do that. So we're going to just go into the diametral compression test directory here because we already have built that material. Open this up. Run it. There's the specimen, right? Brazilian specimen being squeezed. How do I know it's being squeezed? This time, let's actually look at the displacement field. There's the ball displacements. Notice how it's being squeezed, and it's squeezing outward as a result of that. It's bulking out, as you would expect. Here's the force chains. Compression is black. When you squeeze a heterogeneous material, you generate microtension. It's that microtension that causes all the most uh, the cracking to form. Um, there's the magnitude of that. Now, of course, we're also monitoring. That's the force. 
So this is your Brazilian test. There's your force versus axial displacement. We're going to look at also look at cracks. There's your crack. Oh, it just formed a crack. Let's see what it looks like. Where is that crack? Turn off the balls. Right there. Right there. First crack formed. Another one formed. Oh, now we're starting to get some more cracking. As we continue, now we're looking right down that thing. There we go. Turn off the balls. We're getting much more cracking. Let's see if that manifests itself in the force. Dis Ever those cracks form? That's why we got a little dip in that force. Dis force. Force on the walls. Um, fly. Whoops. There we go. More and more. Classic Brazilian test should start from the beginning. It should propagate outward. This is an extremely coarse model. Those that you know, that's really what you're modeling. It's only got 10 grains across. If you put more grains on here, what you're going to see in all these things is you're going to see much more smooth stress strain response. So again, pull that back up. There we go. It broke. If I keep running, flying more strain, that force is going to drop to zero. All right. Last thing. How much time we got here? Uh, four, minutes. four minutes. Okay. I'm going to respect all your time and be done. Direct tension test. We can perform that. Let's do that. Go up here. Tension test. Fire up the PFC project. It's going to go and restore the material we had from before. Now it's going to do the tension test. What we do is identify a collection of particles above and below, and we pull them apart. So it's like we're gluing things. Here's the displacement, the ball displacement. Here is the forces. Notice they're red, they're tension. We're pulling it apart now. Um, and then here's the cracking going on. Whoops, let's look at that again. This is the final state. There's the cracking. There's the force displacement plot. Okay, we're getting a snapback phenomenon because this is actually stress that's being measured with the measurement spheres. It's internal to the material. It's not based on the load on the wall or the load on uh, that we're applying externally. Again, we can talk about that more in the subsequent lecture. All right. We have these example materials for each material, which I've already mentioned. So when you're, when you're building a PFC material, you should start with one of these and then modify it as you go along. There's an example for all. Here's the linear material example. These are the micro properties. There they are. To create a linear material, you have to specify all of these values. This is what the example one looks like. Then you can generate these plots, right? Here's deviator stress versus axial strain. You can take the slope. They call that the resilient modulus. Here's that contact bonded material. There's all the parameters. This is what you get. Like this, there's that microstructural box. There's all the contact bonds in that little box in the middle. Here's the number of grains. There's that bond coordination number. Now this guy we generated with a material pressure of 30 MPa and no, and the insulation gap was zero. So let me put bonds where the guys are actually touching. Um, again, increasing that bond coordination number will increase the modulus and strength. It's more tightly packed, more well connected. Um, all right. And then we can do as, as you saw. There's a compression test. There's the cracks at the end of the test. There's the deviator stress versus axial strain. You can just make that plot in PFC, pull it into PowerPoint, take your slope. That's your Young's modulus. That's your peak strength. Plot the radial strain versus axial strain. That's your Poisson ratio. Notice it's only linear at the beginning. This is also happens in real rocks. You have these hysteretic effects. As cracks start forming, the Poisson ratio starts changing because of the radial expansion is not linear. Here's that uh, Brazilian test. There's your force versus uh, displacement. This maximum force in a Brazilian test can be related to the uh, tensile strength of the material. By doing that test, we get 0.92 MPa. By doing a direct tension test, we get 0.63 MPa. Bit relatively similar. Um, final, here we go. PFC model, you, give, you have this synthetic material. It's a vast microstructural space, okay? Um, you can explore that space in a relatively easy way by using this material modeling package. So there will be future webinars in the next few months that are going to introduce, talk about the general idea of bonded particle modeling, and much more important to everyone who does this is I'm going to discuss how you can go about calibrating a bonded particle model to match the relevant behavior of a particular rock. So stay tuned for more. It's 1030. I really would love to take questions. If you are all here physically, we could sit around for a few more hours and take questions. If you have questions, write them up. 
Um, the best ones are not the chat ones that you write down quick, but give them some thought. Write them up. Send them to Judy Sutherland. I know, I know Judy. Hang on. Where is it? Right there. Um, oh, is it done? Did it just turn off? No. no? I was okay. Just gonna give my Send them to Judy Sutherland. Um, we will uh, we will post this webinar right away, right? Pretty quite pretty quickly. We will also then after that we will when I have some a chance to respond to those questions, we'll post that, um, and we'll also let you know when we are know for sure when these future webinars are going to occur. Thank you for your attention. Um, this is the disembodied voice of Dave Patyandi signing off. Take care. Bye. Okay, you have questions coming, so I'm not going to log off for a few minutes. I'm going to let the questions come through. But oh, there are fine. thank yous to you, Dave. Is Excellent there presentation. Is there still um well, can no. they hear us talking? Yeah. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, I cannot answer those questions right now. Um, but yeah, Judy's going to keep the webinar going, so you can post questions on that. Again, it might be better to just write up your question as an email. You can give it more thought and send it to Judy Zetterland. You might be in trouble here, Charles, if I get 200 questions. Um, <laughs> I'll do those. I'll do those in the evening then, on my own time. Well, let's um, let's just say thank you, Dave. Um, yes. From the responses, it was very, very well received, and I am going to end the webinar. And for those of you who still have questions, please email me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.